For me, collaborative selling means that selling is not something that we do to other people. I'm going to convince you. I'm going to persuade you. I, I'm going to manipulate you into something. But selling is actually something that we do with them, that we're going to create solutions together, that we're going to understand the viewpoints of each other. Because if you actually look up the definition of sales and selling in the Webster's Dictionary, it's an exchange of value. It's not a one-way street. It's an exchange that becomes between two people to solve a particular problem. And I look at sales and collaborative selling as the link between problems and solutions. And that's how we make the world a better place is by connecting those two things together. You're listening to the Sales Today podcast, and I'm your host, Fred Copestake. On this podcast, we explore how sales professionals can develop a modern approach to winning business, the application of virtual selling techniques, how to create meaningful business relationships, and much more. Why not take our free collaborative selling scorecard to see how your sales approach suits today's environment? You'll find a link in the show notes. Thank you for listening to the Sales Today podcast with me, your host, Fred Copestake. I hope you've enjoyed what you heard today. If you did, please get in touch and hit subscribe. And remember, you can take the collaborative selling scorecard for free to check out how your sales approach works in today's environment. You'll find it in the show notes. And welcome to this episode of the Sales Today podcast, where I'm delighted to be joined by Carol Mahoney. Carol is author of Buyer First, founder of Unbound Growth, and entrepreneurial sales coach at Harvard Business School. So Carol, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It is, it is about time that we had this conversation. It is well over time that we've had this, that we have this conversation. Because I didn't mention in the introduction the subtitle to your book. So can you just please share that with us? So the subtitle of Buyer First is to grow your business with collaborative selling. Collaborative selling. Anybody that knows me knows how much I bang on about this. And so to have at least another voice in the world banging on about it, we can bang away on this subject together. So... Oh, yes. no, it's, it's very, very cool to be talking to somebody after my own heart on this. Um, I'll play the melody and we'll have a whole ensemble going. There we go. That's it. That, that yes. The collaborative selling band. There you go. <laughs> um, so collaborative selling, what does it mean? I mean, someone might be listening to this and go, no, I haven't heard you back on about it, Fred. I'm going, really? Oh, amazing. <laughs> um, what does it mean? What does it mean to you? For me, collaborative selling means that selling is not something that we do to other people. I'm going to convince you. I'm going to persuade you. I, I'm going to manipulate you into something. But selling is actually something that we do with them, that we're going to create solutions together, that we're going to understand the viewpoints of each other. Because if you actually look up the definition of sales and selling in the Webster's Dictionary, it's an exchange of value. It's not a one-way street. It's an exchange that becomes between two people to solve a particular problem. And I look at sales and collaborative selling as uh, the link between problems and solutions. And that's how we make the world a better place is by connecting those two things together. I love that, how we made the world a better place. And, and, and isn't that kind of how we have always made the world a better place as humans in that we have collaborated? Is this what we're designed to do? It's kind of how we've survived as a race. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's how we've come up with innovations and technologies and the wheel for, for Pete's sake. So that's how we've always done it. And somehow when we get into sales, we focus so much on the things that we do, the tactics that we do, the techniques that we do. And we do those things to other people a lot of times because we want to get what we want out of it. We want to get the sale. We want to get the quota. We want to get whatever it is. And, but collaboration in and of itself is, and this is why I put it as part of buyer first is that to collaborate with someone, you actually have to almost put their needs before your own or before you consider your own, which is what sometimes makes collaboration difficult is that people go into it with, this is what I need and this is what I want. And how are you going to help me to get it? And I want to shift that mindset and dynamic to putting our buyers first so that we're doing the things for them out of an intention to help them make the best decisions possible for them. Yeah, I love it. It is, it is all awesome. I'm, I'm already thinking about the clip I'm going to use at the beginning of the episode, and so far it's the whole episode. It's a, <laughs> no, because it is all absolutely bang on. 
in the way in which, and this sounds quite sad, actually, we need to do things today. So what, why are we talking about this as a modern way of selling as like, as a cool thing as the, the latest evolution? Cause we kind of are, and that just seems terribly wrong. Actually. <laughs> well, and honestly, if you look at the history of sales and sales, I call it the alphabet soup of sales processes and methodologies that started over, well over a hundred years ago. And it's always become this thing that we've done to other people. Like one of the first documented sales processes was uh, the phrenology. And they called it the science of selling because they actually measured the size of people's heads in the Ford Motor Company when they first had to sell cars. And they used the size of someone's forehead to determine if they were intelligent enough to grasp onto new ideas and concepts and would be more likely to buy a car. And they called this the science of selling. And you just can't make that up. <laughs> And so when we look at the history of sales and how it originated and then the evolution of it, you know, we had the phrenology for the science of selling to start off with. And then we moved into things like the barrier method, which is sometimes even still used today. If you've ever had a life insurance salesman in your home and sits down with you and your spouse and says, well, of course, you'd want to have a life insurance policy so that if something happened to you, your family would be OK. Like, who's going to say no to that with their family sitting right there with them? <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and Bible salesmen use this back in the day. So if you look at the origin of sales and how we got to this place, I don't think it's a surprise then about the mindsets and perspectives that people have towards sales, where if you've read Daniel Pink's book, To Sell as Human, seven out, seven out of 10 of us look at sales as something pushy, slimy or sleazy. You do a Google image search for salesperson, you still get that image of the used car salesman that comes up. And so the, the negative perception of sales is still well and alive today. Like, what kid have you ever heard say, I want to be a salesperson when I grow up or have dressed up as a salesperson for Halloween? And so it is a lot of times something that we resign ourselves into or that we fall into because we feel like we don't have any other options. But the reality is, in my mind, is that sales is a noble profession because of that connection between problems and solutions. Um, and we focus so much in sales on the things that we do, right? Our closing techniques, our negotiation techniques. And we forget that at the other side of this is buyers. And then I've also dug into some of the research about what is it buyers want today? And there's a LinkedIn survey that was done actually two years in a row, which they called Buyer First, which was part of the inspiration for the title. And one of the things that was interesting in that is that they asked buyers, what is the number one trait that you value in salespeople? Active listening was listed number one. It was the last trait that sales managers who had to hire looked for in salespeople. So there's this huge disconnect between what buyers are looking for and how we're going about and conducting sales today. So it shouldn't be a surprise when you see 40 or maybe 50 percent of salespeople worldwide making quota, despite like 70 billion a year that we spend in training and technology. We need to start making a fundamental shift in the way we think about sales and approach it. In summary, then, we are doing something to try to achieve something that people don't want us to do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and and, and we're so bearing in our head against the walk you're why this is not working. And so we just try to do more of it. And so then you see the LinkedIn DM messages, the, the multi, you know, 20 point cadences where they're just bumping the email up. And it's the, these are the things that we do to try to get people's attention and don't take into account what is the other person in this conversation need, value and help that they actually were going to require in order to move forward to solve this particular problem. So, I mean, we see these numbers that we put out there that salespeople get involved later and later in the buying process. And then yes. is that our fault then? Is that, is that the fault of the salesperson? The buyers are saying, look, you guys are not doing what we want to. We're not getting any value from you. And there's enough information out there. We might as well try and fix it ourselves because we'll probably waste less time doing that. Exactly. Well, and what happened is when the internet was born, uh, it suddenly took the power of information away from sales and put it in the hands of the buyer. And so, you know, in 1993, 94, when the internet became commercially available to the world and email was born, it was the beginning of the end of the traditional sales model. We're just starting to figure that out and realize that now. And oh, oh but don't worry, because AI is going to save us from all of it. AI just means we take all the information that's already there and package it in a way that's exactly the same as everyone else is saying. Oh, oh yeah, and boring. <laughs> and then rock up and try and pretend that we're different. Yeah. No, that, exactly. well, unless we do it very, very well. There are awesome ways to use AI, but uh, yeah, cynical me goes, it's not going to get any better in some places. Yeah. Well, well um, 
like I like to take an optimistic view that if AI can help us to reduce the amount of, you know, mundane tasks and administrative tasks, you know, research tasks that we need to do to further a better human connection, what I see happening is that we're going to start seeing much more of a need and emphasis on the soft skills in sales and in business, more on human intelligence and empathy and connection, because that's what people want today. They don't need more technology. They need more human connection. Yeah. But it's the mindset. It's with any of this stuff, it's the mindset of how you use it, isn't it? So yes. I, I come at it as think like a partner. You go buy a first. Same thing. Yep. <laughs> Slightly different <laughs> words. If that is how you're thinking, then you'll go and go, oh, this AI stuff means that I can get so much research done so much quicker, so much deeper, so much better. I can come up with a better thing to go and talk about and we can really start to shift. Yes. Yes. I as opposed to, I don't have to work as hard. I could just fire out a right load of nonsense and it doesn't matter because I don't care. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> and that's, and that's, that's, the, I think the place that we're in right now is that we have, we have choices where we can either go the direction that we've always gone when a new technology comes out and we use that to do more of the same thing, like more of the spamming, more of the advertising, more of the, the constant nagging and, and so forth. Or we can go the direction where we use it thoughtfully and intentionally to the betterment of that human connection. Um, I am hoping for the, the latter in that, that we decide to go in that direction. Because even, you know, you look back to in, you know, nine, like the early 2000s when the internet started to become more popular and SEO became a thing, that had the potential to change the way that people buy. But instead, what people did is they used the same kind of advertising type of techniques that they used prior and just used it in the SEO world. And so I, I forget who it is that says it, but, you know, anything, something new comes out, just give it to a marketer or a salesperson and they'll ruin it within a few months. Does Todd Capone say that? I think uh, that's, that sounds like the sort of thing he might say. <laughs> And I agree, yeah. Or something along the lines of, yeah, we should probably or, or break Seth it. <laughs> Some, well, I think that might be something I've heard from Seth Godin, but way, yeah. way back. <laughs> yeah, it's a similar thing. But no, we are we're at this crossroads, and I wonder if this crossroads is in some ways probably more important for salespeople, because if you pick the wrong path, the mm -hmm. damage that you're going to do to yourself, because mm -hmm. people talk about personal brand, sales stature, or reputation, if you want to go old-fashioned, you can ruin that pretty quickly. And that's a tough one to come back because you've now tied yourself with the brush and think, oh, you're the lazy one who just tried to spam stuff and push stuff. And whereas mm -hmm. I'm talking to people now who are, oh, yeah, you're using this stuff to really help me. So this, well, great opportunity is great harm potential. I don't know. Yeah. What do you think on that? You could be potentially training your buyers to ignore you otherwise. And once you've trained them to ignore you, it's going to be very hard for you to gain their trust and attention again training your buyers to ignore you that doesn't sound like a particularly good idea <laughs> oh it does we might want to try and avoid that <laughs> yeah <laughs> but that's what's happening so every what day every spam message and other said. people are, yeah and other people are training your buyers to ignore you as well the buyers are ignoring everyone because they're not sure who to pay attention to so ignore the lot so you've got to do something to stand out and that's by putting them first it's exactly and the thing is with collaborative selling, like this was, I didn't write the book with the intention of writing about collaborative selling. It was the conclusion that I came to both from my experience, my client's experience, as well as the research that I started doing to dig into this whole dynamic and the exchange of sales. And what I've learned is that uh, I came across a study from Harvard Business School called the Ikea effect. And this is what really cemented it all for me, because in that they, if you are familiar with Ikea, you go there, you buy something, and then you go home and you put it together yourself. And they wanted to understand why people would be willing to do that and in fact pay more money for it. And what they found is that when we collaborate on a solution that we're going to use, when we have some skin in that game, some input in that, we place a higher value on it because we feel it's special and unique to us, which is why we're willing to pay more for it. It also applies to a certain level. It's something has been put together for us by someone just like us versus something that was put together by a quote unquote expert. We don't put as much value on that because I, I, what I personally found is, yes, you're the expert, but do you really understand me and my circumstance and my situation? And we all like to think that we're unique snowflakes in everything that we do, even though there's probably a lot of similarities, but it's that 
by your mindset that I really started to understand that collaborative selling and, and doing this in a way where people are actually contributing to the conversation and the solution and then customizing that based on that collaboration, that's what people find valuable today. And other studies have shown that the thing that people value in salespeople is active listening because that active listening also helps them to ask really great questions that get people to think differently or have a different perspective on the options or solutions or even the problem that they have. And that's what we're here to do is to help buyers make the decisions in their best interest. And in order to do that, they have plenty of information. Our job is to take that information and give them the context. And also, how does this apply to you in your particular situation? Because if they could figure it out for themselves, they wouldn't need us. And you had mentioned that study or multiple studies and surveys that say buyers are 40 to 60 to however percentage of a way through their process. One of the things that's interesting is that they're one of those studies from Gartner showed that, yes, buyers prefer not to interact with salespeople. They're going a certain way through their sales process because sellers aren't adding value in that exchange beforehand. But what was interesting is that those buyers that did, interact, it did not interact with the salesperson in some way had a 23% higher purchase regret than those that did. So buyers still need salespeople, but not the salespeople of yesterday. And so again, the way I kind of summarize that is it's our job to help them think. And that's what we're going to do by asking the questions, by bringing in interesting insight, by mm -hmm. shutting up, letting them talk and kind of process while they're talking. Cause that's what, that's what the question is doing. Yeah. But yeah. if all our questions are about, well, let me just complete my little band checklist here. Well, that's self first, isn't it? Whereas yeah. buyer first, it's like this person needs to be thinking about this stuff. So I'm going to go in there and I'm going to prime them to do that. And it might be uncomfortable for me. And then. Yeah. Yeah, and what's, we've got to sort of work out what's go, that going to be. Exactly. When we're going through that checklist, whether it's Vant or Spin or Medic or whatever it might be, what's happening is it's taking us out of the present moment with our buyers because we're so focused on our checklist and what we want to get out of it. It's why I've created these T-shirts uh, that if you can see it is an upside down, not about me, so that the person wearing the shirt can be looked down and be reminded it's not about me. I, I kept saying it so often to my coaching clients, I finally made the T-shirt to save myself the breath. But what happens is that when we're going in with our checklist, we're not actively listening. We're getting emotionally involved in the process because one, we're either hearing buying signals that say, oh, right, now I can start pitching my solution. Or, you know, our need for approval is so great that we'll tell them whatever it is that they want to hear so that they'll like us because we believe people need to like us in order to buy from us. So these are the things that are getting in the way of salespeople being able to a lot of times do the things that they already know that they should do. But when they get in that conversation with their buyer, they're defaulting back to their old ways of doing things because that's what they're comfortable with. That's what they know. And so we're at a point, I think, a tipping point in sales. I call it the renaissance age of sales, where if we can incorporate data science and human psychology into our interactions in sales, that we can transform sales from that perspective of pushy, slimy, and sleazy to trusted advisor, which is what we all would like to see and feel when we're in a sales conversation. Oh, yeah. The old, the old trusted advisor. But when, people, when you say, speak to salespeople and they say, yeah, I'm a trusted advisor. I'm always like, well, who says? Well, I do. No, you don't get to say that. It's your customer that bestows that honor because of the stuff that you do. Um, okay, so let's get a bit more tactical. This is, this is wonderful. I mean, we can talk philosophically. And, and we need to because we need to kind of have that mindset to go into this to then want to make these shifts that we're going to talk about. Yeah. But some of the stuff that we could do practically if somebody's listening and thinking oh i think i need to make a little bit of a move here what can i actually do what might be some of the things that you'd suggest so there's a couple of things that i suggest uh one of the things is calculate your wee wee factor is what i call it so the wee wee factor is if you look at your messaging or your call recordings and look at how often do you say me we i our where you're talking about yourself or your company or your product and then compare that to how many times you're using buyer-focused language, where you're saying you or yours or they or that means and because of. That's buyer-focused language that speaks directly to how they're thinking and what's in it for them. And so that's one tactical way that you can start to look at, am I really just making it all about me or am I making it all about my buyer? 
And it's a simple shift, but if you start to do an audit of yourself in your own language, then you'll start to see that small little changes of wording starts to get a different response and elicit a different reaction from your buyers. That's one thing. The other thing that I suggest to people is look at the questions that you're asking. Uh, Are the, like you had just mentioned, like people are going through their bad checklist and those types of things, because those are the questions that they need to get through their process to get to the point that they want. So if you take a look at your questions and then audit them and ask yourself, are these the questions that get my buyer the information that they need? Or are these questions that get me what I want? Now, I'm not saying that you don't have questions that help you to move through the sales process. But if you look at the ratio of the types of questions that you're asking, how many of those benefit the buyer to help them to think differently or dig deeper into a particular issue or impact of an issue or obstacles that they might face versus questions like you ask about budget and authority, timing. Those are the things that you care about. And there's no reason that you can't have both of those things existing in the same type of a question. It's again, that collaboration and that putting of the other person first that is not a natural instinct in sales today that we need to focus on. Yeah, no, they're they're out to absolutely cracking things. And yeah, sitting that audit can be quite frightening, can't it? (laughs) You look at it, well, I don't do that. Whoa. I I am guilty of it. So if I am guilty of it, I am sure that there are other people of it. I have to keep a constant mind of my own. And I still look at my messaging and my emails in my call recordings and I listen for, all right, am I following my own advice? Because it is not, our human nature is we love to talk about ourselves. We love to talk about what we think and what we want. And as what actually happens is that when we talk about the things that we think and that we want, it releases dopamine in our brains, which is the pleasure chemical. And the irony of this is, is that if you can reduce your own need to talk about yourself and instead get your buyer to talk about themselves, they're the ones that are getting that dopamine hit in their brains. And that's how we start building trust and relationship with our buyers, because the place in our brains where dopamine comes from is the place where we build relationships and trust. And so by asking open-ended, sequential, collaborative types of questions that ask buyers to share more information about what they think and what they've experienced, then we're starting to build that trust with them where they're willing to open us up to us more. And that's what we need in order to help them to make the best decision possible. Yeah. I mean, talking about that, it's kind of going prepared to show them that you know them. Yes. Uh, I, was, I was talking to Murray Damien about this the day. He's a neuroscientist. And he said, do you know when you turn up and you're not prepared? The effect on the buyer chemically in the brain is similar to that of disgust. Yeah. Sorry? Is it disgust. So, right. Yeah. Opposite effect when you show that you do know them because you're showing something that you've done your research and then you're asking questions so they can elaborate on it and you're being intelligent about their world. I think he sort of the ventral vagal state kicks in where they're kind of calm and relaxed and, you know, they're dopamine and all these things are flowing. I think yeah. you build the trust faster. So, I mean, you, again, there's another fork in the road. Which, which, which one do you want to take? Buy us to be disgusted with you or calm and comfortable and think you're great. It's mm-hmm. uh, a real big well, Exactly. Because when, as I was doing the research for the book, I was finding all of this research and all of these studies, but I wanted to hear it firsthand from buyers. So I started interviewing buyers and asking them about recent purchases that they'd made and what they liked and what they didn't like. And overwhelmingly, it was that feeling of just disdain, disgust, just frustration, like you've wasted my time. Like if I get into a sales conversation and someone asks me to tell me about my business, I'm like, seriously, like you didn't go to the website? It took you maybe three seconds to do that before we got on this call or tell me about your role in your business. Or I love this one where I have people that say, uh, are you looking for sales training? I'm like, I do sales training. Did you not see my LinkedIn profile? <laughs> um, and so like, yes, it's absolutely, I can see that happening because that's what I heard from buyers when they've had to go through these kinds of conversations is frustration, disgust. And then they wonder why people don't make a decision and 40 to 60% of deals are lost to no decision because you haven't given them a reason to make a decision. Yeah, and that's, that's a funny one. You just made me think about that when, when people are reaching out to you and trying to sell you sales training. It's like, well, no, you didn't do your research. They tried to sell you LinkedIn coaching. Mm-hmm. And now I think maybe you did do your research. <laughs> that's why you're reaching out to me. <laughs> but, Web um, development. Or, or I, I mean, I've had things where uh, 
you know, phone services or things like that, that are just like have absolutely nothing to do with I with anything that I do that. But it's just one of those. They're probably mass reaching out to anybody and everybody that that has a LinkedIn account. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, this is great stuff. This is great stuff. Um, good. So we're starting to put bias first. Yeah. By yeah. really thinking about them, their world. And that's the way that we run the meeting, the way we run all our interactions. Yeah. Um, so great questioning, questioning designed to help them think and showing that we've done something to be able to ask that it is going to help us. Anything else that's just worth mentioning as we start to start to God, the time has gone so fast talking about this. I knew it would <laughs> as we start to wrap up any kind of real biggies that we've got to mention. Otherwise we've not done our job right. Our drums haven't been banged at us. Yeah. Well, I think the thing that we also need to take into consideration is, um, there's a, there are specific mindsets and beliefs that impact how we actually do these things. I firmly believe, just like we know that in order to be healthy, we need to eat vegetables, we need to exercise. We all know that's how we get healthy. I don't think there's a salesperson out there or sales leader out there or business owner that doesn't know that we need to be actively listening and asking questions. Like none of this is new news. But what's getting in the way of doing the things that we know we should be doing in the moments that we should be doing them? I know I should be eating a salad for lunch, but I'm really hungry and there's the pepperoni pizza in front of me right now. And the pepperoni pizza is going to win every time. I know that I should probably say no to this particular buyer because this is not a fit for them. But I have a quota that I need to meet and a manager that's on my back. And so I'm going to have to do whatever it takes in order to get this person to buy this particular product. And the thing that about that is when we don't do the things that we know that we should do. It creates a level of what I call a cognitive dissonance within us, right? Because we're now suddenly uncomfortable with ourselves because we know we're not doing the things that we should be doing. And a lot of times the reason that we're doing it is because of outside pressures and things like that are going on. And we're also not addressing the deep set mindsets that are impacting us in our behaviors. In psychology, they have two theories. One is the theory of reasoned action and the theory of planned behavior which basically state that our attitude or intention towards a behavior will dictate how or if we'll even do that particular thing. So what's interesting is I was working with Harvard business students and I was giving them some pushback in the early years about why they weren't asking enough questions in their sales conversations. The pushback that I got from them is, well, isn't that what a salesperson is supposed to do? Make control of the call, give the pitch, make the value proposition, and then ask for the business. It was their perceptions of what sales is became what they thought that they needed to do. And so that's why we need to change how we're acting in sales so that the norm is not the pushy, slimy, sleazy. And really starting to address our long-held beliefs about sales, both, for example, uh, in my work with coaching clients, I use 2.3 uh, data points or salespeople have been evaluated on specific mindsets. And out of those, we look at five different specific mindsets. And one of those is the need for approval. The belief that people need to like me, that need to see me a certain way in order for them to buy from me. And that's what causes us to not ask the tough questions that might upset someone. That's what causes us to say yes to everything, even though it's maybe not something that we're supposed to be doing. That's what a lot of times causes us to violate our own ethics and values in a sales conversation, because we feel that this belief that if I, if I ask that tough question, they're not going to like me, then they're not going to buy from me. I'm not going to make my quota and then my boss is going to yell at me. And so I think that we not only need to change our tactics, but we also need to examine those deep rooted belief systems that we have and how they impact us in sales. The good news is that we can change our mindsets. We can change our beliefs. We just have to be intentional about it and understanding the impact that it has. So if you're frustrated that you're banging your head against the wall that you tried all of the tips, all of the tactics, all of the alphabet soup of sales processes, and you're not sure why it's not working for you the way it seems to work for everybody else, then what you probably don't realize is that your mindsets in sales is what's actually getting in your way of being able to execute on these tactics. Awesome. <laughs> nah, that, that, that's very cool. That's very cool. So yeah, there are some tips and techniques and I don't need to add hacks, but things you can do quite quickly if you're conscious about it. Yeah. But if you're serious about it and want to go deeper, then that's where you are going to make a massive shift. And then things will, will fall into alignment. You'll be neurologically aligned around this. Yeah. And life will be a lot more comfortable and you'll be a way better salesperson. And I think people don't realize that it's the things that we do in our everyday lives that actually impact our ability to do things in sales. So 
like, for example, the need for approval mindset, where we think people need to like us in order to buy from us. And we can't, you know, ask them the tough questions or say no to them. And so if you find yourself as someone who maybe you don't stand up and say, no, I don't disagree with that. Or you find yourself agreeing with people even when you don't actually agree because you don't want to upset them. Or maybe you have a hard time setting boundaries and honoring those boundaries with people. If that's something that you're seeing happening in your everyday life, more than likely it is also impacting you in your sales conversations. So if you can start to change it in your everyday, like for example, disagreeing with people more, maybe not your boss right away, but maybe in a smaller way of disagreeing with people, like when your spouse wants to watch yet another wartime movie and you're like, no, I just can't do it. <laughs> like little ways that you can start to make these small changes in non-threatening, smaller ways, low risk, and start building them up into bigger and bigger things, eventually what happens is that you start to shift your mindset in sales as well. And I believe that if we can live our lives in our everyday as we would in our sales conversation, I think that's when we bridge that gap between you know, ethics and values and selling because we are the same person in all situations. Wow. We are... Moving into different realms, one which fascinates me, I mean, the ethical selling piece is, is a biggie that I'm looking into at the moment. Um, and of course, this whole authenticity piece, is, it's not been done to death, it's important, but not in the way that you're describing there. I think there's a yeah. very different definition of it. I think we need part two at some stage, Carol. What do you reckon? We do. We do. <laughs> we do. <laughs> But the, there's plenty of food for thought in this to, to leave people with. Um, and I'm glad you put that little disclaimer in there. Don't go away and just start arguing with people because you heard us talk about it on the podcast. Yeah, um, I don't want to get emails from people that say they just got fired because they said no to their boss. No, don't do that. <laughs> Carol said on the Sales Today podcast, like, no. No, I mean, you give us absolute tons to think about. So, so where can people get in touch? Because again, I know you produce a lot of stuff around this to, to, to bang that drug to keep this. Uh, yeah. this, this subject front of mind. So where, where can people get in touch? Uh, you definitely find me on LinkedIn. If you can't find me by LinkedIn, then I'm probably doing something wrong. But that's where I spend the majority of my time on social media is on LinkedIn. Um, and then, of course, if you go to my website, unboundgrowth.com, there, there's a form there to, to get in touch with me or learn anything more there. You know, we're, we're updating our blog to start sharing some more of this research-based insights. So definitely check that out as well. I would love to hear from people. What are some of the things that they're challenged by or struggling with that we can start putting some resources to create for them? Brilliant. Yeah, get in touch. We'll, we'll, we'll put the links in the, in the show notes anyway. Yes. Um, get in touch. Mention you've heard us talk on here. And yeah, you know, I'm sure like me, if people ask you questions, that's a gift to us because then we can go away and if we don't know the answer, we can find it out and, uh, and share that back out there. So. Brilliant. I should also mention too, if you go to my other website, which is carolmahoney.com, you can order the book there. And on that page for everyone who orders the book uh, between now and the end of next year, I'm doing a monthly free group coaching session for everyone so that they can apply some of the concepts that we talk about in the book into their day to day. Because that's, that's really my mission and my goal is to help people make those small changes that are going to make a big impact in their sales conversations. Oh, that's, that's a great idea. I love that. So, um, we'll put, we'll put that one in as well. So awesome. brilliant. Carol, thank you so much for coming on and sharing absolute ton of stuff in there. Yes. Um, very much on the same page. Uh, but it's been, been a real pleasure. It absolutely has been. Fred, thank you so much for having me. I can't wait to do part two. Thank you for listening to the sale today podcast with me, your host, Fred Copestake. I hope you've enjoyed what you heard today. If you did, please get in touch and hit subscribe. And remember, you can take the Collaborative Selling Scorecard for free to check out how your sales approach works in today's environment. You'll find it in the show notes. <laughs>